Hi guys and welcome to my channel, I'm Lucy and today we're going to be learning how to play Edelweiss. Now first thing to mention is that this goes with another video I've already created which is the piano accordion tutorial for Edelweiss. In that video I show you how to play the notes in the right hand and the left hand and how to put it all together. So I recommend watching that video first or at least getting the sheet music so you can have that in front of you while we talk about the music in this video. This arrangement is by Don Quattrocci and his arrangement can be found for free online. So if you need to get the sheet music, follow the link in the description box now. This will be a lesson video on how to shape your bellows, your phrasing, dynamics, the fingering you might want to use, how to practice the bass notes, and more. I will be making videos like this for all tutorials in the future. These videos will be available for my Patreon subscribers. This is the only video of this kind that I'm going to make public for everyone. I wanted everyone to see the video so you can get an idea of what benefits you'll have being a Patreon subscriber and I also want your feedback on what kind of things you'd like to see in these types of videos. If you haven't heard about my Patreon, I recommend watching my 2023 channel update video where I go more into detail. Um, basically it is not live yet at the recording of this video. I'm going to be launching that Patreon when I reach 10,000 subscribers. Alright, let's get started. Because the time signature is 3-4, that already suggests that you're going to be using a bass chord chord pattern like this. In this particular arrangement, there is no bass clef notation, there are just chord symbols on the top of the treble clef. How to read this is simple. The letter tells you which row you're going to be using. If there is nothing after it, for example, it's just a C, that means it's C major. If there is a lowercase letter next to it, like a capital C, a lowercase m, that means C minor. If there's a 7 next to the note name, that's going to be a dominant 7th chord. If you don't have the dominant 7th row, don't worry, you can use the major row anytime it comes up. If you've already watched my tutorial, you might notice that I recommend using the counter bass row uh, sometimes to just mix up the bass. I note that by making the letter blue. If you don't have a counter bass row, I recommend just using the related fundamental bass row. For example, if the music is written like G7 and I'm telling you to use the counter bass row of B, sorry, the counter bass of G, which would be B, and you don't have that, just use G. Let's talk about the bellows now. I believe consistency is always key. You need to decide at the very start of learning the song when and where you're going to change your bellows direction. This is to avoid any confusion later on and avoid getting into situations where you're in the middle of a phrase and you've extended your arm as far as you can or you've run out of bellows and you have to change in the middle of a note. As a rule of thumb, I like to keep it even. So that would be two measures out, two measures in, four measures out, four measures in. For this song, I'm doing four measures out, four measures in like this. If you want, you can go out for eight and come back for eight, which would sound like this. either but if you go eight measures out and eight measures in you are having less interruptions so if you have bellows that are a bit clunky or noisy when you change direction going eight out and eight in is gonna minimize the amount of times that that happens to remember where you're gonna go in and where you're gonna go out write that on your music you can use any notation you like you can literally write the word out or in 
or you can come up with a symbol that represents either or for yourself. Whatever you do, I recommend avoiding changing randomly because what will happen is you'll get this audible interruption in the middle of the phrase. For example, you don't want it to sound like this. <laughs> Could you hear that I changed in the middle of a note and then I ran out of air when I was coming back in? If you know exactly where you're changing every single time, you can plan ahead and make sure that doesn't happen. If you want more information about bellows, I recommend watching my video Bellows for Beginners where I talk about this in more depth. Let's talk about the touch. Are you going to play this staccato? Are you going to play it detached? Or are you going to play it legato? Personally, I like to play songs like this legato because it mimics the sound of the singer. To make this song sound expressive and less like a robot, you need to add dynamics. Dynamics are not always written on the music, so it's up to you to decide where you're going to put them. If you're struggling to know where to add dynamics, have a listen to the recording and copy what the singer is doing. This would be playing Edelweiss without dynamics. There's nothing wrong with that but I think this sounds a lot more expressive and interesting. To make that, I'm just putting varying amounts of pressure on the bass strap to make the bellows move faster or slower. When I want the sound to increase in volume, I put more pressure on the strap. I'm putting more pressure on now, and I'm backing away now. Less pressure, more pressure. More, more pressure, and less. I like to phrase down, which means ending with a decaying sound. If you're a pianist, this will be unfamiliar to you because when you hit a key on a piano, you can't change the volume. It will naturally decay. But when you're playing accordion, you can decide whether it decays at all. And if it does decay, how much? So with a song like this, I like to reduce the sound to nothing. When you end the phrase, take a mental breath because the singer at that point in the song would literally be taking a breath. And I want you to take a mental breath or a physical breath as well to separate the phrases. For example, this is what taking a musical breath sounds like between phrases. <laughs> Was a little bit of a pause right before I started the next phrase. If you don't pause between phrases or give any sense that um, you are moving into a new phrase, it can sound a little simple. This is what it sounds like if you don't take any pauses between the phrases. <laughs> of constant continuation which there is nothing wrong with but personally I think it sounds a little bit more human a little bit more expressive and passionate if you take the time to have a little pause at the end of a phrase and start with a new idea if you're struggling with that try taking something physical to help you bring that across in your music for like 
For example, like this. Let's talk about the fingering now. This isn't overly complicated because the range of this song isn't too great. So what I would suggest doing is looking at the lowest note, which would be E. And looking at the highest note, which would be D. You don't go below and you don't go above those notes. So it would be a good idea to keep your thumb on E and your fifth finger on D throughout the song. struggling to remember your fingering and you're muddling it up, you need to write it on your music. I don't recommend writing all of the fingering numbers on your music because that can be overwhelming and distracting, but you just need some kind of visual cue. So I would recommend writing one whenever you get the E and writing five whenever you get that D at the top, just to remind you that that's the general hand position you want to have for this song. What you decide to do between the thumb and the fifth finger is up to you, but play around and experiment so that you get the best outcome for yourself. It's not uncommon to decide on your fingering and then change it later and settle on something else. I do that quite often, but it's important that you're actively thinking about it and coming towards a solution and not letting it be random every single time you play. This song repeats itself, so to avoid just sounding a little bit repetitious, you can play the second time round with a different switch. I like to play with the musette. You might like to play with something else, the master switch even. If you don't have register switches to play to or some of them are broken or something like that, you can just try playing the second round up an octave to create like an instrumental vibe. So you've got the first verse, which is like the singer, and then you've got an instrumental. You might even want to play it three times. You can play it as many times as you like. Now, I want to talk about an exercise you can use if you're having a bit of difficulty with the larger jumps in the song. The first larger jump would be from C major to E minor. For some people, that might not be large, but if you're not used to having to cross multiple rows, this can be quite a challenge. So I recommend developing an exercise for yourself where you just isolate the C major a minor jump. Don't worry about anything else, we just want to master that jump. This is how I would practice it. Firstly, you need to be aware of what position your bellows are going to be in at that particular point. For me, I'm coming in when I'm going from C major to A minor. So I'm going to use the air button to put my bellows where they need to be to replicate that. The reason this is important is because my arm, my wrist, my fingers, they're all going to be in the exact position that they'll be in when I actually come across this in the song. So I want to practice it in the most real light conditions possible. What I'm going to start with is running my fourth finger over the C fundamental bass row. Then I'm going to slide over G, slide over D and land on A, just the fundamental bass. Back to C, back to A back to C, back to A. This time I'm going to take my air button open again. This time I'm going to rest my fourth finger next to my third finger so that it is resting over the C major chord. I'm going to play them together. I'm going to slide over G, slide over D and land on A. And I'm going to use my second finger on the A minor row to play the A fundamental bass and A minor. Back to C, back to A minor, back to C, back to A minor. I'm gonna use my air button to go out there again. Do that as many times as you need before you feel you're ready to move on to the next step. The next step is actually playing the bass note and then the chord. Slide over, 
slide down, slide up, slide down, slide up. You want to get faster and faster and faster at this. So keep going as many times as you need. The most important thing is, is you lead with your fourth finger. Your fourth finger should be running over those buttons so you can feel when you're over G, when you're over D, and when you've landed at A. If you're lifting your fingers up into the air and just hoping to land on A, you're going to struggle a lot, especially if you are a beginner. So use the buttons to guide you. Most of your practice might just be doing that, and that's okay. Because once you've developed this skill, you'll be able to bring it into all of the other pieces that you learn. When you're feeling more confident with that jump, start playing the actual pattern. Bass chord chord, bass chord chord. We're not even going to worry about the right hand at this point because we need to get confident with that jump. And remember, keep bringing your air button out so you can be exactly where you are in the song when you get there. When you're feeling confident with that jump and you can do it at tempo, no mistakes, try the right hand. And then stop and just do that again. Use your air button. Another place in the music where you might find a similar difficult jump is from F major to D7. Remember to lead with your fourth finger, slide over C, slide over G, and land on D. Do lots of slow, deliberate practice on the left hand jumps if you need to. There's no rush to learn this song. Do it at your own pace. Just do it correctly. Thanks for watching this video, guys. This is my first video in this lesson style format. I am really interested to hear your feedback. I want this to be beneficial to you. So please let me know what did work, what didn't work, what confused you, what was boring and repetitious. You can be completely honest with me because I am making this for you guys and I want it to be as best as it can be. I will be answering all comments in the comment section, so please go crazy. And remember, this content is going to be for my Patreon subscribers only. So if this is something you think you'd be interested in, please have a look out for my Patreon going live. It should be in the next couple months when I reach 10,000 subscribers. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye. Bye.